everyone, and welcome one more time to Story Stalking, a division of Dead to Rights, the podcast video for the crime genre industry. I'm your host, Donna Carrick. Today we're going to be reading for you a wonderful story by Rosemary O'Bear, who is the author of Don't Forget You Love Me and other great crime stories, as well as poetry books, for example, Midnight Boat to Palermo. Um, and uh, also Strong, Certain, and Alone. Look for Rosemary O'Bear on Amazon and you'll find all her diverse works. She is really a top writer here in Canada and she's well worth your attention. And her story, which appeared in In the Key of 13 by the Maydams of Mayhem, Carrick Publishing 2019, is titled The Beethoven Disaster. And I'm going to read it for you now. The Beethoven Disaster by Rosemary O'Bear. To be successful in any endeavor, you have to do three key things. You have to focus. You have to make sure that the person or people you are working with are 100% reliable. And you have to stick to what you yourself know best. If I had not forgotten these things, I would not be incarcerated today. It started when I was six and in the first grade. It was art class and the teacher told me that being an artist of any sort meant that you got an idea and used that idea to make something that other people would want to experience. Well, that was okay and I knew how to make things. What I didn't have was any idea of what to make. So I watched the other kids and I saw that they had lots of ideas. I soon realized that all I had to do to work on my project was to copy one of theirs. I decided on a portrait of a puppy. There were 20 kids in our class. I was pretty sure that meant quite a number of puppy pictures. I just kept my eye out for the one I needed, big enough to see all the details clearly, but little enough to not take up too much paper, crayon, or time. I hit it lucky. I saw that there were lots of kids who didn't seem satisfied with their early attempts. They kept drawing picture after picture until they got it right, and the versions of their masterpieces that they rejected got thrown out one way or another crumpled up in the garbage, lying underfoot on the floor, even just abandoned in little piles on their desks. All I had to do was take one. I had lots of crayons and pencils and even a paint box. My mother had given me these nice things in the hope they would encourage me to work on my school art projects. Well, they did. I carefully traced the best puppy picture I found in the garbage. I made sure that I didn't miss any detail. The picture showed that the puppy had a nice furry coat with spots. He had black eyes and what looked like a swishy tail. I didn't know why anyone would throw away such a nice picture, but someone had. As I wrote my own name in the corner, I thought that if anybody said anything about the picture maybe not really being by me, I would say that yes it was, and anybody who said differently was just a liar. Never happened. The teacher gave me an A for the assignment, and when I brought the picture home, my mother said that she had always known that I could do good drawings, and that as a reward, she was going to give me more advanced art supplies, paint in tubes, and brushes, and even a palette. Well, it didn't take me long to master the use of those items. At first, everything I did was what today would be labeled abstract. I enjoyed working with the paints, dabbing them onto the palette in what I learned was a certain prescribed order every time, mixing them to make new colors. But when it came to using them to make an actual picture of something, I was stumped. Then I had the good luck of going to the public library one day and discovering the art section. It was many years before I was good enough to make my first copy. It was a Mondrian, lots of colored squares and black lines. 
easy. And what made it even better was the fact that my mother's sister, my aunt, told me she loved the painting and wanted to buy it. She offered me $10. I was on my way. I copied more complex modern paintings, Chagall, Picasso. My mother and her friends and relatives found them amazingly well done and very charming. Before too long, I had a little business going. The fact that nothing I sold was ever really by me didn't seem to bother anybody, least of all me. You should really go to art school, a lot of people said. And one day, I decided they were right. I suppose you could say that art school was where I discovered my true self as an artist. Because there, my awkward abstracts were somehow considered innovative, and I also learned how important it was to be pleasant and persuasive if you're trying to convince someone of something. Like when I convinced my teachers and fellow students that I could do a traditional painting if I wanted to but preferred to experiment, to reveal myself in art. Of course, at art school, I got a couple of years experience at learning to identify the techniques and materials that various artists used. In class, I carefully did all the technical exercises until I could pretty much get any effect I wanted. At night, I studied books that were full of pictures of the paintings of the masters. I was always trying to figure out how they could make a picture look so real. I seemed to do fine in art school. My abstracts were accepted for assignments and appeared in the annual art show every year, often selling, to my amazement, to strangers. But every time I had to do an exercise or an assignment that depended on realistic picture of an actual person or object, I failed. Until luck seemed to give me an answer to my problem. The art college decided that to be responsible citizens, it wasn't enough to just work on our own projects. A committee was set up to recommend things we could all do to help our brothers and sisters in the community. I was chosen to be a mentor to a boy who was only a little younger than me, but who had already been in trouble with the police and had already spent time in detention. When the teachers there had been handing out assignments around the city for students, this boy was picked to take night courses at the art college. He's always drawing something, his parole officer said. And, for some reason, it seemed natural to my own teacher to assign him to me. You are a good, diligent worker with excellent technical skills, the teacher told me. You can share your knowledge. At first, I was a little afraid of being assigned a student who had, as I understood it, already spent time in jail. But I had no choice. Besides, who was I to look down on a fellow artist when I had spent pretty much my whole life copying the work of other people and pretending it was my own? I showed him how to copy pictures. I explained to him that a successful copy, I never used the word forgery, not then, not ever, had to be the same, but different. I also showed him how the changes he was making in the copies had to be consistent so that every copy purported to be a picture done by me, for example, had to have certain characteristics, certain consistencies that marked the painting as mine. With his skill and dedication, I graduated from art college with the highest honors, with a gallery eager to represent me, and with the offer of a teaching position at the art school. Of course, I had to turn down the teaching position, but my assistant and I put together a gallery show that brought in several thousand dollars, which we split 50-50. Those were the beginning years of my life as a realist painter. First, works by me, and before too long, undiscovered works by artists far more famous. Until, between the two of us, we learned how to fake everything, the special pigments of every age whose works we duplicated, the paper, 
canvas, board, and linen. Between us, we learned about provenance, the history of a work, usually the history of its ownership. We figured out how to copy signatures with total accuracy, and when we couldn't copy one, we created it. If it bothered me that we were liars and thieves, I suppressed the thought, and my assistant was always eager to look upon us as top-notch artists in our own right, rather than as defilers and deceivers. So it all went well, financially and reputation-wise, until the day the assistant convinced me that it was time that, as he put it, we should branch out. That was the day he precipitated the Beethoven disaster. And because I let myself forget my three principles, our fate was my fault. Manuscripts, he said to me one day as we sat in our studio discussing whose work was currently marketable enough and currently obscure enough with reference to its history that we could work on it safely and profitably. What are you talking about? What manuscripts? I had just read a fascinating account of the long and complicated provenance of the Voynich manuscript, an illustrated work purportedly from the 16th century that some considered a complex and beautiful fraud. Whether it was real or fake, the manuscript had to have taken years to construct and had never been proven real or fake. Eventually, it landed in a university library, whether as a donation or a purchase, I didn't know. But I could easily see that all the trouble it had taken, some real or imaginary person to create it, could not have netted the profit all that work deserved. The easiest, I think, the assistant answered, would be music. I stared at him in wonderment. We had a good operation going. We had now worked together for years. We knew exactly how to create lost works by old famous artists, by recently deceased modern artists, by promising but never before seen artists. Why in heaven's name should we be changing our product? I knew it always bothered my assistant when I referred to our works as products, but clearly they were. And like all successful products, they had a market that it would be totally foolish to meddle with. What do we know about manuscripts? I asked him, trying to control my frustration. Why should we switch to something we know nothing about when we've been so successful at things we are experts at? He was strangely silent. He had always been an enthusiastic partner in everything we'd done. So his sudden reticence struck me as odd, even as dangerous. Well, he finally said, I think we have to be a bit more careful than we've been. Why? The market's a bit, I don't know, sensitive at the moment. I should have listened. I should have taken this as a warning. Though he had been my assistant, over the years, he had often demonstrated that he knew more than me in some areas, areas having to do not with the production of artworks per se, but with sales and making contacts and establishing the fake history of every piece that we had produced. Is someone on to us? I asked with alarm. His answer made perfect sense. We've been at this for five years, he said. In that time, we've discovered just as many masterpieces of art. Sooner or later, it's going to occur to someone that our record is too high to be accidental. Too high, period. The time to quit is now, before anyone questions us. I think we should consider music. Music? What do we know about music? Only that a historic manuscript is no different from a painting. Lines and circles and curves and dots. Here, he said, take a look at this. I didn't wonder about his having proof of his theory. He always had some object, some document handy to prove his point. 
It was, after all, an important part of his trade to prove things, just in case somebody thought of questioning him. What he showed me on his phone was a web page from a site about Beethoven. It depicted several pages of music manuscripts written at different times in the composer's career. There was quite a difference in the appearance of the works over time. I could see at once that anyone attempting to forge a music manuscript, especially one by a famous composer, would have to have quite a precise and accurate knowledge of each stage of that composer's musical trajectory over exact periods of time. We don't know anything about music, I repeated. At least I don't. We don't have to know anything about music. Look, look at these pictures I got off the internet. He moved to my computer and pressed a few keys. Within seconds, he handed me a paper copy of a part of a musical score for a study that Beethoven had written in his later years. Of course, the master himself had never heard the notes written there. Perhaps no one had. A lost bit of paper like this had surely never been performed, though it was impossible to think that no one had ever tried it out. The online photo was remarkably clear. I could see at once how it could be copied by hand on the right paper in just a matter of hours. I could also see how lucrative it might be for a skilled forger to produce what were basically scraps of paper and small splashes of ink and then dispose of them for hundreds of thousands of dollars. There is one big problem though, my assistant admitted. He was never the type to declare a challenge without also declaring that he knew of a viable solution. What? Paper, he said. What? It's just the same as canvas or board or linen. We have to have the exact paper for the exact date of Beethoven's execution of whatever we decide to copy. Really? And just how are we going to get that? I asked. The same way we're going to get the right ink. The same way we're going to age the ink. The same way we're going to get the information necessary to have every square centimeter of our little piece of Beethoven 100% authentic. He stopped and stayed silent for a moment. The same way, he said, that we have done our work every single time. I was unconvinced, but I had worked with him now for several years, and I was aware that he always knew what he was talking about. Had I not been thoroughly convinced of that at all times, I would never have been able to work with him not only in the techniques he shared with me in creating the copied pictures, but in creating their provenance as well. Leave it with me, he said, and he disappeared as he had often disappeared for weeks, even months, to bury himself in the arcane research necessary for our craft. Three weeks later, he showed up at our studio unannounced and carrying one of the countless portfolios he possessed. This one was new, simple, slim, shiny, leather, with a small handle and a closure that was a snap rather than the zipper that sealed his larger portfolios. I knew the minute I saw it that it contained things I'd not seen him toting around before. What's this? I asked. What we need for a start. He pushed aside some papers and a coffee cup on my desk and opened his little portfolio. He carefully extracted a paper envelope the size of a letter. I stood over his shoulder, overcome by curiosity, but pretty certain that I knew what was inside the pristine envelope. I wasn't at all surprised when he reached inside a pocket in the portfolio and pulled out a pair of plastic gloves like those worn by a nurse or a dentist. He also had a plastic sheet in the pocket, and he carefully unfolded it so that whatever he was about to take out of that envelope would not touch anything on the desk. I had figured out what I was about to see. What I had not figured out was how he had gotten what he was about to show me. I almost held my breath as he tipped the envelope and allowed its contents to spill out onto the sheet. 
there were at least 10 pieces of fragile, stained, sometimes even water-damaged paper, identifiable instantly as something very old, very rare. Each piece of paper was worn and sometimes ragged on the edge of one side, but in every case, the edge of the opposite side was smooth and clean. I knew at once this meant that we had crossed a line, that we were in immediate danger of being caught, not only for our preliminary preparations to fabricate a Beethoven manuscript, but also for all the work we'd done over the years. How could you do this? How could you be so careless? Do you realize what you've done? He shrugged as if the crime he had committed was no big deal. You've been at the music library these past weeks, haven't you? I demanded to know, though the answer was clear. You've been cutting up manuscripts. You've been defacing precious documents to get paper for the Beethoven project. He would possibly have answered, I suppose, but it was too late. It was already too late. He turned abruptly toward the door. He tried to scoop up his collection of stolen paper pieces, but his hands were shaking, and there was nowhere to hide them or himself, and nowhere for me to hide either. The footsteps on the stairs were heavy, determined, as determined as the slam of the door to the studio, as determined as the cops who handcuffed us both, who pushed us down the stairs into two waiting cruisers. It's too long and disturbing a tale to tell again after all the times we had to tell it to lawyers, to judges, to art dealers and museums and even to universities. Too disturbing to admit to ourselves and I suppose to each other had we ever spoken again was that we had been thieves for a long time. That what we had stolen, the ideas, the execution, had been precious until we got our hands on them and ruined their meaning, their pristine refinement, their unique existence. Of course, being the kind of criminals we were, we never damaged real art, never damaged anything real until the Beethoven disaster. We got long sentences and the day the judge handed them down was the last day we ever saw each other. Now, in the solitude of my incarceration, having been found guilty of a non-violent offense, being an aging man, I am separated from real criminals. Ironically, I have been chosen to work in the prison library. It doesn't matter that there is nothing worth copying or even reading actually. The only thing I've ever used is the collection of vintage recordings. Once in a while, I listen to a little piece by Beethoven a sonatina, a bagatelle. As I listen, I can almost see the notes on the page. Dots, swirls, neat lines, and sometimes crooked lines, written as though in a hurry. Ideas. Someone else's ideas made mine for a moment in time. For unending moments in time. And that has been The Beethoven Disaster by Rosemary O'Bear. And if you are not familiar with Rosemary O'Bear's work, I strongly encourage you to look her up. She is a true artist in the meaning of the word, in every sense of the word. I've read so much of her work. And her love of art and of numbers and of knowledge in general just comes through on every page. Every page she writes dances with an inner knowledge and an inner delight. So please read her works. And uh, I want to thank you all for spending your time with me here on Story Stalking, which, as you know, is a division of Dead to Rights. And I hope you'll find us also at Dead to Rights. You can download us on YouTube. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. And we're always happy to have you come back and join us again next week. And my thanks also to Ted Carrick for the wonderful theme song that we share with Dead to Rights, titled Eyes of Gold. See you next week.
dusty road, man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it rides.